more customer success than customer acquisition. Yes, yes, definitely. So we then built out our journey maps with a lot of consultation with customers and with partners. Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive great business outcomes by focusing on CX and culture together. I'm excited today to be here with Andrew Carruthers, who's the Digital Customer Experience Leader at Cisco Systems. Thanks, Andrew, for joining. It is my pleasure, Matt. Thank you for having me. Awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun today, and I'm really looking forward to getting your perspective on how uh, customer experience and digital come together. Um, you know, you've built up an award-winning customer experience organization focus on customer success and a broad-based partner network that you really built up a really broad partner network for Cisco. What have been some of the key focus areas on your own journey to build a more customer-driven organization? Well, that's a great question, Matt. Um, uh, a little bit of context. When we started um, the CX function at Cisco, it was after about 25 years of selling hardware where we sold the product, customers bought it up front, paid for us up front, and then it was really on them to get value out of it. Um, once we decided as a company to shift to a recurring revenue business uh, where we were selling services and software, that's when we knew we had to build a CX function because then the onus was going to shift on us to make sure customers were getting value uh, from what they were buying and could renew and would be interested in renewing at that point. So there were about 50,000 employees. We dipped our toes in the water with a hundred <laughs> in the, in the newly created CX function. 50 of those were renewal managers who on Friday were in the sales organization, helping to renew services contracts. On Monday, they were in the CX fund, uh, organization doing the same thing, which really means there were about 50 of us that were building a new organization out of this 50,000 employee company. So it was a, I, I will not lie, it was a heavy lift to, to work within the company to help drive a more customer-centric organization. It's not that Cisco didn't care about our customers, but honestly, they were locked into a Cisco ecosystem in their IT organizations. They weren't going anywhere. Um, so we were well known within the industry for having an amazing customer support team that would you know walk across hot holes to support customers. Um, but that's different than being customer centric in product development and 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 in um, customer experience, like the whole bit. So we did a, we did two things. We first of all spent a lot of time evangelizing within Cisco to the business units that were creating product, to the sales organization, to the marketing organization. A lot of time evangelizing about the need for customer experience. What is customer experience? 15 years ago or so when we started this, customer experience was not as well known and even I would say widely accepted as a specific discipline as it is now. So we couldn't just point and say, that's what everybody else is doing. Um, so we had to build that, we had to evangelize and build that knowledge within the company um, about what is CX? Why do we need it? Um, how is it different in a SaaS world and a, you know, this renewable business world and in the hardware world? And then, evangelizing about what is the discipline of experience, what makes a good experience to try to help people understand uh, the changes that we were therefore going to need to make internally in order to develop, in order to deliver a wonderful experience. So things like making it simple for customers. Um, we had to completely redo our website, which is a massive endeavor and was 15 years old at that point. Uh, was really, you know, filled with lard and <laughs> it was slow and it was unresponsive and it didn't have modern SaaS capabilities like try and buy, et cetera. So that was a massive multi-year redo as a result of this change to being an ex a customer experience driven organization. Um, we had to talk about being a connected organization. So Cisco is historically a, um, a serial acquirer of companies. Many of them small, some of them huge, like Splunk most recently. Um, we've acquired probably 250 companies through the 40 years we've been in business. And every time we build them, traditionally, every time we bought them, traditionally, we've let them do their own thing, which meant we were heavily siloed. Um, siloed processes, siloed data, siloed organizations. 
So to be able to cut across all that, if we were going to deliver a connected experience. And then part of that also is delivering a consistent experience so that customers, when they're, when they're engaging with, our, with WebEx and other collaboration products, it's a very similar experience as when they're engaging with our firewall or other security products or our networking products, rather than it being feeling like they were working with different companies. That was going to require some significant changes to the, to the product development teams and to the marketing teams for all these different units. And then we had to make sure that we were driving an omni-channel experience, meaning that, that our focus was on going to customers where they wanted to engage, whether it was in our Cisco communities or on our website or social channels or email, whatever it might be, versus, well, we'll send an email and they'll come to our website and, you know, too bad for them if they don't, right? So radical shifts in terms of how we think about customers. So we, it was a heavy lift to spend a lot of time evangelizing on on what CX, you know, what, what CX is as a function and then the discipline and then how to change behavior within the company and convince them of the need. And I will say that just like anything else, there was a bell curve. Um, you know, some folks were early adopters, especially people who were newer to the company. Some laggards, especially folks who'd been there a long time and had done perfectly well, you know, selling hardware and, you know, don't bother me, I'm doing great. Um, but eventually we got there. You know, it was, it was a journey, but eventually we got there. You know, when you think about the, um, the evangelization and like helping get more and more people bought in, what helped you get people aligned and get people moving in that same direction? Was it the focus on the right outcomes? Was it, was it a process? What was it, you know, something else as a, you know, a hook that got people on board? I would say three things. One was, um, storytelling. We were very conscious in building out a story that explained everything that I was just talking about in a way that that people could plug on to. So we talked about um, we first of all we showed examples of what other companies were doing that we thought people could relate to. A lot of conversations around Ring, for example, or Peloton, and how they had in store and how that was connected to the application and the data flowing across, so that. You know, whether you were on your, your Peloton bike or you're taking a walk around the neighborhood with Peloton walk or whatever it's called, uh, you know, the data was all connected. So, uh, or you're going to see your stats on the web, right? That kind of way to demonstrate in ways that we thought people could, could glom onto. A lot of those examples came from the B2C world, which was part of our story as well. Hey, we're competing on experience, not just against companies that we're competing against selling hardware. But the experience that people have when they're going to Amazon or Ring or Peloton or whatever it is. Um, so that was one. We used a lot of data as well from trusted third-party resources. So industry analysts, Gartner, Forrester, um, TSIA, the Technology Services Industry Association, um, from our own partners. Um, as I mentioned, we're about a 95% partner-driven business. So when we got quotes from our partners, and many of our partners are not only Cisco partners. So we, we intentionally went to some of our larger partners who do a lot of business with, say, Microsoft as well, who had already started to make that. They were ahead of us timeline-wise when it came to making the transition um, to a customer-focused organization in the SaaS world. And we had those partners providing quotes, to, you know, in sort of pushing Cisco um, to make the change lauding Microsoft for the change that they already made or Adobe. Um, so we sort of brought in competitors in the tech space as well, or at least, you know, uh, other companies in the tech space, even if they weren't direct competitors. Um, so there, there was, it was bringing in tr essentially trusted third parties to help us make the case. And then we would, we would laud people internally when they did, you know, you know, when they did the right thing in terms of, you know, changing behavior, et cetera. So, um, so there was a, there was a lot of, of, you know, showing people and using third party resources to convince people as well as communicating with them in a way that, that they could understand. You know, most people are like, oh, I, I know Peloton. I have one. I have a friend who's got one. You know, I, I can, they could understand that analogy, that, that, um, that, that analogy or that, that example, same thing with the ring doorbell. So we were very intentional with, with showing people, you know, the whole connected approach from using other examples. You've used um, the word behavior a few times. And um, in, I'm 
you know, maybe I'm keying in on this because of my own hammer in search of a nail focus, but, you know, the name of the podcast is the CX and Culture Connection. And that's the name of my book too, the CX and Culture Connection. And the connection to CX and culture is actually through emotion and behavior. Uh, and that, you know, behaviors can be customer behaviors, or they can be employee behaviors and behaviors evoke emotions in the journey. Digital is fascinating because you're also evoking emotion, but without a human behavior involved all the time, right? They're complementary. but I'm be curious to hear, you know, how you're thinking about behavior. You've used the word a few times. Behavior is the driver of culture, you know, skills and relationships and mindsets are also important for culture, but behavior is what makes cultures work uh, and what makes the, um, the impact happen. So how do you think about behavior and how have you actually defined them and activated them? Storytelling is one mechanism. Right, right, right. Well, um, we'll talk, you know, if from an internal behavior change standpoint, um, a lot of emphasis on sort of traditional change management techniques. A lot of conversations with um, with senior leaders in the sales organization, the marketing organization. Marketing was earlier to come along. Sales was a little hesitant. Um, so we first started off you know, just even if we focus in on one one element of of the customer journey from the, the Cisco process side, right on our side of the of the of the fence, um, of just the sales handoff from sales to CX. And we put together a form, a digital form for our sellers to access. We tried to make it as simple for them to access uh, and to fill out the form. So that basic information about, about of what the customer was buying, why they were buying it, et cetera, would be transferred to the CX organization. And then we build out the process again to include a brief um, connection meeting between the, the CX person and the, you know, the CSM and the seller, and then bringing in the customer for a handoff meeting. All of this sort of documented with digital, all of this, right, that, that, that form was digital, making sure that that form was tied into uh, our CRM system, Salesforce, et cetera. Um, but then there was still needed to be the behavior change that you're talking about. And sellers weren't filling out that form. To them, it was just another uh, bit of admin that they were asked to do that was taking them away from selling. So tried and true approach, started off with SPIS to try to get them to do it. That moved the needle a little bit, not a lot, not a sustainable approach. So then we went to the sales organization, we went to the sales leadership um, and um, and tried to get them to insist that, they're, that their um, sellers fill out the storm and sort of smooth the process. Because our, our CSMs were getting on the line with customers um, or we were trying to engage with them just purely digitally. We knew nothing about why they bought what they bought. So... Um, so it was problematic. And at first I'll say some of our sales leaders were reticent because again, we were asking them to do something other than sale, uh, other than sell. Um, but once we were able to explain to them the value add, meaning here's traditionally, and we didn't have Cisco data at this point because we hadn't been doing it long enough, but uh, pulling in data from other parties, um, as I mentioned before, Here's how this is likely going to grow sales, you know, especially when you're down the line. This is how you not only get renewals, but grow that sale, um, build loyalty, give you the opportunity to upsell and cross sell. You know, a little bit of a leap of faith on their part because they had to sort of, you know, look at this theoretically and say, let's give it a shot. We were not, um, you know, asking for a whole lot of the seller's time. So it was helping the sales leaders understand the value to them in a time frame that was short enough that they could take a wait and see attitude um, that that they, like that helped when it came to that specific behavior. Um, I it took a lot longer to change the behavior of some of our of the different acquisitions that we've had that were running their own deal. Like, no, we're good. We know how to do this. We've been doing this. That's why you bought us. No need to change. Um, at a point, we started to get, uh, and this was a big changer, we started to get the voice of the customer involved, uh, where customers started to complain. And every time we heard of a customer complaint, well, we grabbed that and we put we 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 use that in presentations and elsewhere. So 
we had a, a slide in a, in a presentation that we used about the discipline of experience, right? This evangelizing, we had a slide that had a couple of, couple, a uh, couple of, um, customer quotes on it. One was a customer saying, um, it's like you've taken a, a box of Legos and thrown them open on the floor and told me to build a model of the Eiffel Tower with no instructions. That's what doing business with Cisco is like. And we had another one that said, it's like I'm using, it's like I'm, I have nine different security products from you. And it's like I'm working with nine different companies. And to be honest, they're not all best of breed products. So why would I, why would I do this? Once we started to have customers saying things like that, and we could bring that back into the conversations with the product developers, with the product marketers, with the product sellers, um, that really started to, to open some people's eyes. So we formed a very close relationship with our customer support team because they had a lot of this data as well. So it was really trying to make the case um, sort of theoretically, but then using other voices, especially customers, to drive the importance and the urgency um, that, that really started to change people's minds. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing a common theme through a lot of what you're saying is that, you're, that, that Cisco made a pivot in strategy from products to service, which created a business imperative, a need to, to evolve the approach. And that because of this was a, a fairly new thing, I mean, some people stayed in their same roles, but they, it required a lot of, of focus of, of you and other leaders to help drive change, right? And that the way you drove change was to pay a lot of attention to the value you were going to create, to like to, to get all the stakeholders on board of how this is going to create value, to communicate and reinforce that many times, this is how we're creating value but then to focus on behavior adoption, right? And then, then deliver value through work. And what's really interesting also, there's a common thread around ease of doing business. And the ease of doing business is both for the customer and for your employees, and that you've been addressing both of those in order to get, like the, to get the adoption you want by the customers, you need your salespeople to be participating too. Um, so you really paid attention to ease of doing business externally and internally. And I'm, I'm going to shift the gears to digital in a minute, but I want to first ask, is that capture kind of, um, is that, do you think that reflects what kind of, well, what you, what you've been saying? Yeah, absolutely. And making, making CX relevant to our different audiences, right? It was a new organization spun up. A lot of people just said, I don't know what they're doing over there, but whatever it doesn't, it's not related to me. So making it relevant to them. And I, I want to underline what you just said about ease of doing business internally as well. The, it goes hand in hand. It's two sides of the coin of making our internal processes uh, more efficient, smoother, you know, taking out the friction internally helps to take out the friction externally or from a customer or partner perspective as well. So it's hard to developing a better customer experience or partner experience also involves creating a better employee experience. Hundred percent. So you you're um, you've got a role that that focuses on digital customer experience, and a lot of B two B businesses are really interesting for digital because it's very hard to get a hundred percent digital experience in B two B. There's speed bumps along the journey. I like to say, and digital helps you ease the friction of speed bumps and hopefully do it in a, dig, in a, you know, a digital first way that removes the need for touches and makes it easier for the customer for you. But it's hard to get rid of all of the speed bumps. And often companies will focus on particular parts of the journey, like, um, you know, um, custom quoting or delivery lead times or other sub journeys that they're trying to make more and more digital first. How, how do you think about um, digital experience and, and where have you been focused? Well, when we, we've had a change in terms of how we think of digital experience. When we started, we thought of digital as a scaling mechanism, um, purely as a scaling mechanism. And so classic sort of customer segmentation pyramid with the, you know, the high touch, the medium touch. Uh, we had, you know, high touch CSMs with just a few customers, the medium touch CSMs. Um, that are really, you know, maybe have hundreds of customers. 
And then low touch was just pure digital. Um, and um, we've shifted now because we think customer expectations have shifted, started before the pandemic, but really accelerated with the pandemic to where we think every customer wants a digital first experience, not necessarily digital only, but uh, they want to have the option to self-serve, whether that be going to the website to find information or um, asking questions and getting responses from their peers in our in our um, communities or um, you know a chat bot or uh, or just a chatting with a human, whatever it might be <clears throat> that customers want to be able to go on their terms, you know, in the middle of the night or in the middle of the workday, whatever it might be, and just get the answer that they're looking for quickly and easily. As long as they know that it's easy for them to connect to a human if they do need you know, further support. So that's a shift in terms of how we think of digital from only for the you know, sort of low dollar value, long tail customers to every customer, which means that even if there's a high touch CSM, we need to make sure that not only are we providing a digital experience for our customers, but that we are digitally connecting everything with the CSM so that they know what digital touch points the customer is engaged with, whether we've pushed it out to them or they've come to us to get it. They know when they're getting on the phone or or sending or however they're communicating with a customer, you know, they know the history of that customer, not only in terms of purchasing and adoption, but the digital connection points as well. So that's a little bit of a shift in terms of how we're thinking about it. Um, and a lot of of the components of a digital experience are the components of a of an overall CX um, approach. Uh, we were fortunate when that, you know, as I mentioned, when we built the CX function, digital was was absolutely part of that from day one, as opposed to a bolt-on later on, which means our approach to digital is the same as our approach to CX in general. Make it simple, keep it connected, consistent, omni-channel, you know, et cetera. So, so that helps for us, helps us. And then, when we looked at our journeys, we've really focused in on, to begin with, um, the, the, the customer journey post-purchase um, and focusing in on sort of adoption through renewal. Um, so we're, we didn't start off by looking at, um, you know, the quoting and ordering component to that. Other than re- with, as it relates to renewal, yes. Mm-hmm. But that's a, that's a different process than a new purchase. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, at a much easier, you know, sort of simple process. It's more, 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 more customer success than customer acquisition. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, so we then built out our journey maps with a lot of consultation with customers and with partners to what are the steps, what are the emotions, and you know, what are the what are the key moments, the moments that matter within that journey, uh, and what are the emotions that customers have today. <laughs> Um, and we know where we wanted to go, but where are they today? So that we can try to build in the, the 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 appropriate emotion or the positive emotion in the moments of matter that matter along that journey, and build that all out. Then add in the infrastructure. You know, what what are we going to need from uh, from our own tools and systems and processes that play into that? How does that get in the way of what we're trying to deliver? How does that support what we're trying to deliver? I sort of figure all of that out and then make changes as necessary to then roll out the process. Uh, easier to do you know, the first time around because uh, there's less of a time imperative. Um, but once we built the model, we built it to be sustainable for other, other elements of the customer journey and across different platforms as well. What's fascinating is you know, we're talking a lot about B2B and SaaS here. But there's actually a lot of parallels to other markets. Um, I've, I've been lucky to work across a lot of different industries. I started in retail and then have done a lot in tech and financial and health and industrial through working with other partners before I went out on my own. I, I was a partner at a big firm. Um, and um, what's really stuck with me, Andrew, is this idea of moments in the journey that not only have an emotional impact, but actually have a huge impact on the customer lifetime value. So what you see this in loyalty, for example, where the first 90 days after joining a program have a huge impact on the lifetime value, 
because of the experience driving habit building behavior adoption in the first 90 days has a huge impact on downstream value. Um, this is something I, I talked a little bit with uh, Neil Hoyne, who's the chief strategist at Google in our podcast together. He wrote the book Converted, which is a great read. You know, that the customer lifetime value is something that's influenced by behavior and you build relationships with people to influence that behavior. This is true in healthcare. It's true in financial markets. It's also true a lot in SaaS markets. Because if you don't get the onboarding and the experience right early on, it's really hard to renew and cross sell, upsell. They just quiet quit. Yeah, I, you, you're absolutely right. I, I think that there's when it comes to delivering experience, it's no longer about B to C or B to B. It's B to E. It's B to everything, right? So, what you're exactly true, uh, correct. The the experience that customers have in in one uh, one industry. Uh, or one, you know, whether it's B2B or B2C, they expect to have wherever they're doing their, their business. So, um, and the, what makes sort of the, the construct of a good experience is the same, regardless of whether, you know, they're buying toothbrushes or networking equipment. Um, so I think that it's taken, I think, people a little bit of time to come to that realization, um, but, I, but I'm on the same page as you. That's absolutely the way it the way it works. Are you able to, you know, you talked about emotion and, and, and identifying the right emotions. Are you able to weave that into your customer listening efforts to see whether you're getting the right emotions along the journey? We are. Um, we, we do a lot of listening as do, you know, obviously a lot of companies, um, everything from sort of traditional surveys and CSAT and MPS surveys and individual product surveys uh, at our user conferences, which are, uh, twice a year and they are massive, you know, thousands of people arriving. Um, we do sort of, you know, person on the spot interviews. We have uh, more structured interviews, focus groups already set up, built into the process. Um, we do, when, as we're developing our own experience and certainly other product teams when they're developing products, do lots of focus groups. So there are a lot of, of both survey-based as well as one-to-one -one interview and focus group um, type of communications with customers. There's also this tremendous uh, volume of customers speaking to us through social media, through our Cisco communities. We have 20 million annual unique visitors to our peer-to-peer -peer communities. It's a massive, you know, sort of treasure trove of information. We are we are um, evolving the way that we're listening to that from simply trying to manage that community, for example, um, and marketers, you know, doing some social media monitoring, but really for marketing purposes, to really embracing all of that as a voice of the customer that we can then bring in in a close loop fashion. So we're starting to use AI to help us ingest this massive amount of data to understand what are the key topics that customers are talking about? And with all the different products we have, it's really the key topics for that product or all these individual products and doing sentiment analysis on that as well so that we can start to understand at a mass scale, you know, what are customers struggling with? What are they frustrated with? What are they happy with? We have happy customers too. Okay, where do they think we're getting it right? Um, and then start to be able to analyze that with large amounts of data um, drive some insights from that, and then use that to improve potentially the products and certainly to improve the experience that we have with customers. I think, you know, going back to, to what you mentioned before and the first, the importance of the first 90 days, there's a lot of research that shows that customers are looking at what they, prospects in the buying process, are rating their perceived or expected customer experience as their number three buying criteria, even more important than price. So their you know, functionality, does it do what I need it to do to quality? Will it break all the time or will it actually work? And then number three is how hard or easy is it going to be for me to get the value that I'm trying to get out of this? And then number four is price. So then once they become a customer, I think that first 90 days is sort of the show me stage, right? It's the, it's the proven. If it's 90 days, it's hard for me to work with you. Now I'm frustrated. 
a lot of customer, or I should say a lot of prospects then in their buying process are going to companies, peer communities, or they're looking at reviews uh, for not only sort of product quality, but ease of use and ease of doing business with the company. They're doing that research up front, which means we need to listen to those customers, whether they're on Reddit or in Cisco communities or you know Twitter or whatever it might be, as well as when they're you know communicating directly with us, um, and then figure out how to analyze all that massive amount of data. So that's that's how we're trying to manage that right now. Well, I mean, what you're highlighting is there's enormous opportunity to leverage AI to mine a broader set of data signals beyond just open-ended questions in a survey. There's so many more pieces of data um, that are out there. Um, th this is, I would point the listeners back to my uh, couple podcasts. One is one I did with um, Sid Banerjee, who was the founder of Clarabridge, which was acquired by Qualtrics. So he's a pioneer in the AI space. Uh, was their chief strategy officer when I interviewed him. He's uh, since gone off to do some other things. Um, um, really innovative guy. Um, and then also you could check out uh, my um, my podcast with um, um, Oxo AI with um, Amar Estrapathy. Uh, when and he's he was the head of analytics at PwC. We used to be partners together, and now he's got a, a high, hyper growth startup applying AI. Uh, with like AI companions, and it's it's really fascinating. Like in B two B, a lot of the AI is used to summarize and mine insights. But increasingly, you can create experiences that are either self service, like obviously you're talking about chatbots there, or augmented, where it's a companion with really complex. And in B two B, you're trying to deliver ease of use, but also expertise. And that's a challenge with AI is to replicate the expertise and relationship of a human being. It's one thing to share information or, or capture it. It's another thing to replicate a relationship and, and, and expertise and scale that in a way that people are comfortable. But that's why I think why you say digital first, not digital only. Right. Yeah. I, I'm doing a lot of work focusing on AI. So both of those episodes that you mentioned really resonated with me. Um, and we're looking at and AI as a way to do several things that you were talking about. So sort of big picture, understand the customer better. So it's the type of thing we've been talking about. Um, and figure out how can we use that information to both understand our customer, but then also inform the journeys that we're building. Um, so we're doing you know a lot of listening, as I mentioned, and using predictive AI uh, or sort of traditional you know, data science as it used to be called, um, to to analyze all these signals, you know, to do all this listening and analyze the signals and derive insights from it. And then we're using AI to help personalize the experiences, the, the other element that you talked about. So it's everything from, and this gets into more of the gen AI uses, but informed by that predictive AI knowledge that we're gaining. Um, so everything from um, personalizing content. So this goes to personas, um, and and personalizing everything in the way of translation, certainly, um, but also form factor. Um, people might want to watch a video, but maybe they want that information not in a video format, but in an FAQ format or an infographic format. Maybe they don't want to listen to an hour long video. They want a series of three minute you know chunks. So using AI to chunk out that hour long video into smaller chunks to put in the captions to translate that. Um, using AI to to provide the opportunity in a way that we couldn't before because we never have the budget to hire the, you know, an army of people to do all of this personalization of types of content um, by um, by geography, by maybe a level of technical expertise required. Some people want more of a business level overview for uh, when it comes to the information they're looking for. Others, the more technical, want a real deep dive. So to be able to provide the opportunity to sort of choose your own personalized adventure when it comes to engaging with self-paced resource guides or um, adoption information or success tips, whatever it might be. So personalizing the experience that way, but then also personalizing the experience when it comes to understanding what's what should the journey be and how do we tailor it by industry, how do we tailor it by you know job title or level that sort of thing? 
So really using AI from a, from a experience personalization standpoint, as you mentioned, bringing in also into that the adoption data that we have for customers so that we know where they are, uh, where they are in their adoption journey, if they're stuck relative to you know, other customers in a particular adoption stage. And if we can then bring in that information from the predictive side, from the data science side, and, and start to understand when customers say this on day 30, they are likely to have a problem on day 90. Let's not, wait. Let's not wait for them to get to day 90 and then react to the problem they're having. Let's steer the car away from the cliff before they even know they're heading to the cliff. What you're highlighting, you know, about, you know, migration of innovation across industries in the consumer space, we got here a little earlier with personalization and micro segmentation. So like, I like to think of micro segments as a, a more granular than a persona, ideally rather than replacing your personas with micro segments. Um, I like to think of it as going deeper but without losing the personas, like clustering micro segments against the persona. Um, in the consumer space, we've proven for years, you know, Amazon started this and uh, that if that you have a finer and finer thin slicing of the micro segments and you personalize, you can triple or quadruple the ROI of your marketing efforts and of the way you engage. And you can start journey orchestrating of tailoring and creating journeys that are unique in a micro segment using data signals to trigger which, which, which uh, journey to deliver, right? In the B2B space, people have been more resistant and slower to have, one, because they don't always have the data to know where in the journey someone is. Um, and two, they see it as more difficult to orchestrate the experience in that tailored way. But we're getting there, and you, I think, are at the forefront with digital uh, customer experience of actually thinking about orchestrating the experience in a digital first way that allows you to tailor it as, as you get more and more data in a predictive way. Well, thank you. I think you're, I, I completely agree with your assessment of how things have gone. It's sort of a flip from, from I think in the, I don't know, in the, in the seventies and eighties, was sort of big business was the leader and then consumer goods would sort of follow along. I think there's been a shift with that, probably driven by Apple and, and other very consumer-friendly tech companies. Um, I remember when companies first started to let sort of Apple and, and other products into their own IT infrastructure, Cisco moment. Um, and that's really sort of changed the way you know, we all, as, as employees, as consumers, think about sort of the interplay. And you're absolutely right. I think the consumer world has driven the the development of experience and the development of the discipline of customer experience. One other thing I want to I want to touch on that that you just mentioned because you were spot on and I don't want it to get lost. The importance of data. Uh, people ask me how do I get started? You know, with help my company build an effective digital experience. And step one is data. It requires maturity around data, not just having data, but a maturity around data practices. So step one, figure out what data you've got, what customer data you've got, purchase data, adoption data, uh, renewal data, uh, you know, whatever it might be, um, the, the listening post that we've talked about. Um, it, it, it then requires, how do you then connect that? It took us, when we started back 15 years ago within our CX organization, it took us three years to identify and get access to all the data points within Cisco. We didn't even know where all the data existed. Honestly, sometimes we'd find out about it from somebody else. It was like pulling the, pulling the thread on a sweater and it would lead us to another data source in another part of the organization. And sometimes people said, great, you can be connected to this. I love what you're doing. You know, get an API pipe into my data. Uh, and other times people said, no, you can't, this is my data. Like, well, it's actually Cisco's data. So we're all the to you here. So there was some behavior change required there. So three years to get connected to all that data. So, uh, you know, identify and, and, and document all the data sources that you've got in your company, um, figure out how to clean the data, um, how to make sense of the data, how to make sure you, you store it in, in one central place, um, a, a customer data platform, or if it's not all stored there, 
how you can use that customer data platform as a hub from which you can pull data in from all the sources so that at least you can access it all at once. And I heard something at a conference recently. Someone said, data is the fuel and not all fuel is clean. So you have to do some data cleansing and, and you have to think of data as, as, as an ongoing resource that's valuable that you need to, that you need to sort of, you know, protect and clean and store and, and keep up to date, et cetera. So I want to really highlight the importance of data in all of this. We think about our customer experience and the digital element of customer experience from the perspective of being externally driven, right? What, what experience are our customers having, whether it's through CSMs or digitally, um, but so much of that is dependent on what's the infrastructure that we've put in behind the scenes, how connected have we become with processes and people and platforms and data in order to be able to be ready to provide the experience for our customers. I totally agree. It's a really good shout out. I, I'm going to say yes and to the point about data, um, which is that you can um, you need to be careful not to fall into a trap where there's a long road to a small house, where you spend a lot of time on the data and the technology, letting the perfect become the enemy of the good. It's important to kind of fix the foundation, clean the clean the garden, weed the garden, whatever metaphor you want to use. But you don't want to prevent getting value and action. Like there's a three year, three month trade off. It takes sometimes it takes three years for some things to get all the way there, but you don't want to wait three years to get there. You want to do stuff now in the next three months, even as so. There's a parallel tracking. And what that often means is picking some places you can create value on a roadmap and sequencing things on the roadmap based on value and doability. And some things are green. You can do them out of the box. You can do them right away. Other things are red. It's going to take longer. You have to weed the garden before you can do them. You have to kind of harden the systems. You have to do the work. You have to put the time in. Other things are yellow. You can do them with a minimum viable product. You can do them with a swivel chair. You can do them with a broken back end for a period of time to fix it. You can do it with a process workaround. Or you can do some integration and process change that's less effort. But you only, there's only so many yellow things you can do at once. right? But you don't want to wait until all the red things are addressed before you do anything. That's a great point, Matt. Yeah, thanks for that. For the add-on there that puts some... Structure around it. Yeah, absolutely right. And as you were talking, I was thinking back to 15 years ago. I'm thinking like, yes, 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 yes. So I we put that in practice. Yeah. All right. Totally. Um, Andrew, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I know you've sparked a lot of great ideas for me, and I'm sure you have for the audience as well. Uh, thanks for coming on. And what can folks do if they'd like? Is LinkedIn the best way to get in touch uh, with you? Yeah, LinkedIn's the best way. And I encourage people to reach out and connect with me, you know, reach out to me directly if you've got questions. Uh, love connecting with people and sort of spreading the gospel, if you will. Thanks so much for your time and your insights today. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it.